my name is Dr. Tom Holmes, um, and I work with the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, uh, and I work within the marine science team uh, over there. Uh, super interesting listening to John's talk about the, the uh, class that you guys are involved in and the, the marine and maritime studies. It sounds like an amazing opportunity you've got there. And, you know, I certainly wish those kinds of opportunities existed when I went through school. Um, you know, it was much more of a, a uh, find out as you go. But um, anyway, I'll jump straight into it, aware that we've only got a fairly short period of time. And I do want to leave the option for you guys to have some uh, questions at the back end of it. So I will get into it. Um, so if you do have questions, please write them down. Um, I do like to interact with people at the end of the classes. So um, yeah, please make sure you ask those. So just sharing a screen. All right, can someone give me a thumbs up that you can see that? Cool, beauty. Thanks, guys. Yeah, so yeah, as I mentioned, my name's Tom, uh, you know, I work with uh, DBCA. So the talk that I've been asked to give today really uh, is around the location and characteristics of Western Australian uh, marine ecosystems. Uh, the job that I have over here in Western Australia has me working uh, very, very diversely across the state, everywhere from the Kimberley in the north um, all the way to the south coast and everywhere, everywhere in between. So I do have a fairly good grasp um, of all the different marine ecosystems we have. Um, I just start off with a bit of a background. Uh, it's always good to have a bit of a, a talk about where we come from on each of our journeys. Um, and I have to say that my journey isn't a particularly conventional one in the marine sciences sector. I, I grew up in inland inland Queensland and in Jagera country in a, in a place called Toowoomba. Um, I lived there all the way through my school years and until I was 17. Uh, you know, I grew up around dams and, and river systems and, and droughts and, you know, heavily eroded farmlands. Um, I think it's ironic, I actually learnt to snorkel, uh, diving for golf balls with my brother in the uh, in the local golf course uh, late at night. Um, so I didn't come from uh, an area that was close by the ocean and I developed my love of sciences in general um, before my love of marine science. And it was actually a school teacher that I had when I came into year eight, um, had a, an old bloke who used to be an old dive instructor. Um, and he still had a passion for, for the marine sciences and, and what he used to do on the weekends, he, he and a few of the parents, he, we'd all load in a bus on the weekend uh, and we'd head down to drive three hours down to the coast uh, and go diving for the weekend. Um, and so that's where my real attachment to the marine side of it really came from. Uh, and then I got a strange idea in my head that, uh, you know, I desperately wanted to do marine sciences. So when I was 17, I, I took off and left home and, and moved up to Townsville in North Queensland. Uh, and initially undertook aquaculture, um, but shifted across to marine sciences um, when I realised that aquaculture really wasn't my thing. Um, I was very lucky. I spent about 10 years um, up in North Queensland. I did my undergraduate, my honours, and then my PhD up there. Uh, and during my honours and PhD years, I spent about four years uh, working out of a place called Lizard Island Research Station, uh, which is off the, uh, the north and Queensland coast. Um, and in terms of my subject area, uh, I was really a, a fish ecologist. Um, so I studied fish behaviour uh, and coral reef fishes. Uh, in, in 2008, um, I finished up my PhD uh, and randomly got offered a job over here in Perth. I'd, I'd never really been to Perth, um, but saw it as an amazing opportunity. Um, so I came straight out of my PhD and took up a research scientist job uh, and worked in that position for about six years. Um, before I moved into another position, which was coordinating uh, the department's uh, marine monitoring program across the state. Uh, and then about three months ago, I've now moved into another position, which is the marine science program leader, um, which is basically managing the team of scientists and conducting my own research um, in that space. So a little bit just broadly about what our team does. Um, DBCA, I'm not sure if you're aware. Um, you probably are, I'm sure, of DBCA in some capacity, and most recently the, the, the whales on the south coast at the moment. Um, but we manage the terrestrial and marine reserves um, across Western Australia. Um, we manage and conserve threatened fauna uh, and ecosystems um, as well across the whole state. So the marine science team that I work within is a team of about you know, mid-20s 20, mid 20 uh, science staff. Um, and we have a focus on marine science uh, and on the research and monitoring to inform management. Uh, of the marine reserves and threatened fauna. And on the right hand side of the screen there, you can see a map of Western Australia. And you might not be aware, but all of these areas in blue um, are marine reserves around the state. And it's quite significant. 
uh, and our role really operates within those area within those areas. And as you can see, it's quite significant through the Kimberley, but does all run all the way down to the south coast. Uh, there's a new planning process uh, currently underway along the south coast of the country as well. So just briefly about uh, biodiversity um, to start with, Western Australia does have extremely high biodiversity. Um, we have some 12,500 species of plants. Uh, I think it's about 5,500 species of fish. Um, you know, 1,300 of those aren't even found anywhere else in the world. Um, it's an extremely diverse place. Um, as I mentioned just before, we also have extremely high levels of endemism. So endemism basically means uh, it's something that's not found anywhere else. So there's lots and lots of species in Western Australia, uh, basically that have evolved here through time and exist nowhere else on the planet, which gives us, I guess, a particularly high standing. Um, I guess when you consider where it sits, uh, both nationally and internationally. And as such, it's really recognised both across the country and, and globally. Um, so Australia has, I guess, 15 um, biodiversity hotspots, uh, and eight of those are actually in Western Australia. And those grey areas um, highlight where those biodiversity hotspots are. And as you can see, they really follow that coastal strip all the way up. And that has a lot to do with the unique environments that actually exist uh, along those areas. So why is it that uh, our marine environment or and Western Australia a whole, as a whole is so diverse uh, on the ecological side? Well, the first answer to that one really is is it's big. It's it's really, really big. So I've kind of overlaid, uh, I guess, an outline of Western Australia onto a map of Europe here. Uh, and you see the scale that we're actually dealing with um, as a completely useless fact that you'll probably never remember. Western Australia is exactly the same size as Kazakhstan, which I found really interesting when I was doing my research on that one. Um, but it's an enormous country, oh, sorry, an enormous state. Um, our coastline stretches over 12 and a half thousand kilometres, which is more than a, a quarter of a way around the globe. Um, when you include all the coastline of all the islands of uh, Western Australia, it goes up to about 20,000 kilometres. So it's a massive, massive, massive area. When you consider the latitudinal range, so the area from uh, you know, the top of the, the state all the way down to the bottom, it spans about 22 degrees. Again, that's enormous and about the same latitudinal range of the United States. When you consider at the top of the United States during winter is in deep freeze, uh, and then down in the south during the summer, you know, it's the warm tropics. You know, that's an amazingly huge range of environments that can exist uh, within the one state. Now, one of the other main things that really drives our marine environment is the water temperature. And again, there's a massive variation in this um, across the state. Up in the north during the summer, the temperatures can get up to 28 to 30 degrees in the water. And then down in the south along that south coast during the winter, uh, those temperatures go down to sort of 16, 17 degrees. So again, that creates a lot of different environments for a lot of different species um, to both evolve and exist. Sorry. I'll try that again. There we go. Uh, the other one that really is a driving factor on Western Australia are the currents. You may have heard this name before. It's it's quite a common name in Western Australia, the Lewin. So we have a very strong southward driving current called the Lewin Current that runs down our coastline. Now, the interesting thing about that, and particularly for uh, like what I mentioned before, the endemism, so what that means is it's basically through time, it's driven the species south um, along our coastline and basically isolated them largely in the southwest area. Now, that's what's created that high degree of endemism in our state. Basically, species have come over here, they've become isolated, uh, I guess, on the west coast of Australia uh, and haven't had a lot of mixing from, from other areas. And as such, through time, that's allowed lots of different species to evolve. And then lastly is coastal complexity. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have uh, over 12,500 kilometres of coastline. Uh, um, some 3,700, 3,800 island systems. Uh, and the state opens up on the north to the uh, to the Timor Sea, on the west to the Indian Ocean, on the south to the Southern Ocean. So there's a lot of different aspects and availability there for different ecosystems to evolve. Uh, and as such, when you consider all of these together, basically you can say it supports lots of different marine ecosystems. So when we consider what the different ecosystems are in, I guess, over here, there's, there's a, I guess, a lot of different things that I can consider. Um, I was aware that only sort of had 30 minutes to talk today. So I did just look at the list largely um, that was provided of the, of the main ones. 
but I will mention that there are a number of ones that I won't be talking about today um, that are also very prominent in Western Australia. Um, the main one of those is uh, soft sediment communities. So basically all those areas of sand and mud um, that you see uh, actually play a really important role in our uh, marine environment as well. Uh, and the other one is the intertidal habitats. So things like your uh, intertidal rock platforms, intertidal uh, sand and mud areas up in the Kimberley. Uh, again, they play extremely important roles in our marine ecosystem, but I don't really have a lot of time today. So I'll just be going through the main ones. Now, the first one I'll be talking about is uh, is the mangroves. Um, just a few pictures there of, of some of the different mangrove communities we have in Western Australia. Um, I'll then go through some of our estuarine communities. Uh, onto our seagrass ecosystems and seagrass communities. Uh, uh, then into our tropical and temperate reef ecosystems. And then lastly, the, the cool one, but the one I, I probably know very little about, um, is our deep oceans. So all those areas below about 400 metres, um, those environments we have over here. So just to start off with, I will, I guess, just jump straight into to mangroves. Um, the map on the right hand side of the screen um, you can see here is mangrove distribution um, i guess around all of australia um, so the areas in darker green are those areas where the mangroves are more significant uh, moves into the lighter green and then the yellow where there is you know just a few kind of dotted around so you can see largely that our mangroves really stretch from the nt the northern territory wa border largely down through the pilbara uh, and then a little bit scattered um, through uh, shark bay so yeah, when we consider that, uh, you know, the main areas, um, I guess, of mangroves that you see is, is this area up in the Kimberley, which is fairly significant uh, and fairly continuous through that coastline. Um, down into the southern Kimberley in areas like Roebuck Bay and 80 Mile Beach, where it becomes a bit more sparse. Um, through the inshore Pilbara area, um, again, which is a fairly complex environment, um, but where you do get these things called arid system mangroves. Uh, and then down into Shark Bay, where they become very, very sparse. Now, interestingly, there is then a massive, massive jump. Um, there's absolutely no mangroves that exist south of Shark Bay, except if you're down in Bunbury. Uh, and this particular picture down here um, is the lagoon um, just inside the, uh, the harbour at Bunbury. And there is actually a fairly significant stand of mangroves that actually exist in there. I'm not actually sure how they got in there uh, or when they actually started up. But it's quite an unusual one, given that you've got such a massive gap from Shark Bay uh, all the way down there. So I'm not sure if someone came down one day and randomly transplanted a mangrove down there and it's just grown ever since. So I'm not sure really what happened there. Um, one thing I will mention is it's not just about the mangrove ecosystems. So this is an aerial photo that we've got that's been taken from Roebuck Bay. Uh, and this green fringe that you can see around here, that's the actual live mangrove trees. Uh, and they're just on the, I guess, on the seaward fringe um, of the coastline. Now, the interesting area is all of this area that's kind of like a whitey grey colour up and behind it. Now, that's what's known as a coastal salt marsh or coastal uh, floodplain. Now, they often, and, and particularly in Western Australia, that they play a really important interacting role with the mangroves. Um, so when the tides come in or when you get big floods, um, what happens is all of these areas fill up with water. Uh, and in those ecosystems, you've got, I guess, in this picture over on the right, is commonly what it looks like. You get mixed communities of this stuff called like samphire and large algal mats in there. Now that holds, holds a lot of nutrients uh, within that area uh, and is a very important role working in tandem with the mangroves. In terms of some of the characteristics, um, there are some species that are really, really adaptable. This picture here on the right is uh, a species uh, known as the white mangrove or Abyssinia mariner. Um, now this one exists, when you consider the latitudinal range of Australia, it exists everywhere from the south coast all the way up to the top of Australia. So it's present across that whole area. So that basically means uh, it can exist in a lot of different temperatures, uh, I guess a lot of different rainfall levels, levels uh, and a lot of different salinities. So it's a highly adaptable species. Um, generally speaking though, uh, mangroves are more diverse and abundant in warmer waters and in warmer climates. Um, this is a figure that was uh, taken from a big mangrove review. And the main ones I want you to look at here is, is the climate, um, where you've got a big range of climates in Western Australia, um, from your humid tropical areas up in the north, uh, all the way down to 
you know, you're subhumid, you're, you're semi-arid and you're cooler weather climates down in the south. Now, the species distribution, which is this, this figure over here on the right, um, the bottom right, um, and that's the number of uh, mangrove species that exist in the different areas. So up in the Kimberley, you have about 13 different species that are up there. Um, once you move down into the Pilbara, it decreases down to, what's my marker? Decreases down to sort of six or seven. And then you, as you move down further and further, really the only one that exists down the south is that Abyssinia mariner one. Now, mangroves are salt tolerant, um, which basically means they can, um, you know, basically sit in uh, complete um, salt water uh, for certain parts of their uh, certain parts of their life. Um, however, they do need freshwater input. So, in terms of the, uh, I guess the, the, the um, soils in which they exist, they do need um, a certain salinity within that that is below what's in the oceans. So what you often find, and particularly over here in Western Australia, is, is a lot of the mangroves exist on these coastal fringes uh, around, I guess, uh, I guess waterways um, that do receive some form of water flow at some, some, some time of the year. So they're often not permanent waterways. There's often not permanent fresh water running in. But as long as there's some form of fresh water flush at some time of the year, and, and often up north, that's during the, uh, during the wet season, <clears throat> That freshwater flush is enough to drive out enough of the salinity in those soils uh, to make them tolerant uh, for those mangroves. Now, one of the other characteristics about them is they only really exist in low wave action and sheltered environments. You really only find them uh, in, uh, I guess, in bayments, uh, in estuarine environments. This is a, a good example from up in the Kimberley, where you've got the coastal strip along the outside, which does get the waves. There's no mangroves. Once you move inside into this lagoon and estuarine system, it's absolutely full of them. Now that's because they do they can erode with waves, um, and it's also largely a reason why we don't see any mangroves from Shark Bay south. So once you say get south of Shark Bay, we don't have a lot of sheltered environments. Um, you know, if you compare that to the east coast of Australia, um, where you get mangroves all the way down to uh, Victoria. The reason is that is is largely because they've got lots of complex little embayments and stuff down that coastline, and that's the big difference there. Um, in terms of how they survive in that environment, uh, the soils that they exist in not only are they uh, you know high in salt, but they're also low in oxygen because they're waterlogged. Um, there's no pores of of oxygen or anything in there uh, that allow the plants to breathe. So the way they do that is through these emergent root systems. Um, this here is another picture of the uh, Abyssinia species and have these prop roots called pneumatophores that pop up through the soil. Uh, this one's another species called Rhizophora, has prop roots. Uh, and again, all of these during the, the high tide have root systems that exist above the waterline. Now they have specialized cells um, on, those, uh, on those roots, um, which do allow them to breathe during those high, high tide environments. Now the other important attribute of that is when those high tides do come in, the same root systems um, trap organic matter um, and create all the soils, the rich organic soils around the mangroves, but also create really complex habitats under the water. And this is just a figure, um, again, of a couple of different species. And what you tend to find is during those high tide environments, you get a lot of fish and other organisms that come up into those mangroves and utilise that space. And the other important thing with that is because they trap sediments, uh, when you consider it from a larger scale, and, and this is again is an aerial photo uh, from Exmouth Gulf looking down. Now through time, they trap those sediments and what they do is they create these highly complex uh, environments of estu or I guess little snaking estuarine systems um, that come in through it. And this creates a lot of different habitats and a lot of different spaces uh, on those coastal strips that allows a lot of different animals to utilize that area. In terms of the different species that utilise them, uh, again, you do get a lot in there. Um, you get everything from your uh, your mud crabs and your other uh, invertebrate species. You get tons and tons and tons of different uh, uh, mollusks um, that utilise it. You get a lot of birds that roost in there and feed in there. You get some really specialised fish, fish species, and this guy's super interesting. He's, he's a mud skipper. Um, they have the, the ability to hold their breath for a long period of time and actually skip along the top of the mud out of the water. Very, very cool species. Um, you do get a lot of uh, fish species that utilise the uh, the mangrove roots um, during the high tides. 
And then interestingly, you also get a lot of juvenile turtles. Uh, and this is something we've been finding recently um, up in Roebuck Bays, Bays, is in all those little estuarine areas. Um, a lot of the juvenile green turtles up there go right up into those estuaries and utilize that as essentially a nursery ground when they're young. Okay, on to our next one is estuaries. Now, I'm not going to lie, this is one that I probably don't know a huge amount about, but uh, happy to talk through it. Uh, and I did have to do my research on this one because it's not an area that I have traditionally worked in a lot in the past. Um, but in the context of what we're talking about here, um, I'm viewing estuaries basically as, um, I guess, as uh, river systems or creek systems that have freshwater flow. Um, but then open out into the ocean, so whereby they have some form of tidal influence that comes in. Western Australia doesn't have a lot of estuaries along a lot of its coastline, um, basically because we don't have a lot of permanent river systems. Now, the main areas of focus where we do get those estuarine areas is, is up in the Kimberley, where we do get a lot. Closer in down to Perth, where we have probably our most well-known uh, estuarine system, the Swan Canning River system. Uh, down into Bunbury, uh, we also do have some estuarine environments. And then along our south coast as well, um, where we do have a lot of smaller river systems to open up um, down along that south coast region. Now, as I mentioned, the way we're kind of defining it here is not those river systems that only flow at certain times of year. We're looking at those river systems that do have a relatively constant freshwater flow. Now, what you find in those environments is that the salinity does fluctuate a lot. Now, not only is this with tide, so when the incoming tide comes in, the salt water actually moves up into that water system and create, increases the salinity further and further up. But then also, uh, I guess, seasonally, um, you know, the, the I guess, uh, rainfall patterns here in Western Australia, like they are everywhere, are, are highly seasonally based. Here it's during the winter. So what you find is during the summer, um, the salinity in those water systems, of those uh, estuarine systems actually increases. And then during the winter, when you get all the rain, it actually flushes out uh, a lot of that salt water and it becomes highly freshwater based. So with those changes in salinity, you get a lot of changes in usage for the species that live in there. One of the main roles of, uh, I guess, estuarine environments is uh, it sits around, uh, I guess, nutrient transport, uh, where it's essentially the, uh, the bridge between the terrestrial space and the oceanic space. Um, we do get a lot of problems with this, obviously, these days with uh, things like agricultural nutrients and stuff flowing down our um, estuarine environments. But traditionally, that's a, I guess, a natural part of the system as well, too, if you take those agricultural stuff out of it. Um, it's important to get, I guess, the natural nutrients through that system, um, and it's a, it's a natural part of it. Uh, it also drives down the sediments, uh, and that is where you end up with our, like, things like your uh, mangrove systems. Um, closer to the shore that trap those sediments um, trap those sediments and create their own ecosystem close into the shore. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know there's a high the massive range of salinities that exist in those those environments. and so you do get to tend to get a mix of saltwater and freshwater species um, depending on where you are in those estuarine environments. And the other interesting thing is you do get a lot of species that utilize those changes in salinity in their reproductive migrations. So there's many species out there that will only breed uh, or have their young when they're up in freshwater environments. But then when they've done that, they move down into marine uh, marine environments. Now, those, unfortunately, are also species that tend to be highly vulnerable to change. Uh, and some of those species, uh, I guess, in Western Australia are listed as uh, threatened and endangered. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the groups of, uh, I guess, animals that do utilise that space, um, over on the left here is one of the species that is, uh, I guess, highly threatened in Western Australia, and this is our, our sawfish. Um, and these guys utilise, I guess, the estuarine systems up in the Kimberley and Northern Australia. They are one of those species that go upshore, um, sorry, up creek to, uh, to have their young. And then when they're bigger, they come down into the open water environments. Another common one um, many people are probably aware of is the saltwater crocodile. Um, again, that often exists way, way, way up in an estuarine environments, uh, but then sometimes comes down and cruises out in the salt water as well. Um, a barramundi is another one of those species that moves um, through the estuarine environments. Um, but outside of that, there's a lot of different groups of animals that utilise it, including things like uh, migratory birds um, that often come in uh, and roost in some of those areas uh, during certain times of year. On to seagrasses. So... 
First thing I will say about seagrasses is uh, West Australia has two very, very prominent seagrass areas uh, and globally recognised. Um, the first of those is, is Shark Bay, um, which is the area um, highlighted here. Uh, and the second of those is Geograph Bay um, down in the south, uh, I guess just off the coast of Busselton. Um, now, Shark Bay is particularly uh, important uh, and is recognised globally. And uh, there was some really interesting stuff um, around Shark Bay that's come out recently. Shark Bay actually harbours the largest uh, plant in the world. Um, there was a genetic study that was run up there, and there is a single plant, uh, a single seagrass up in uh, Shark Bay that is 100, 180 kilometres long. Now, that one species of seagrass is basically bred, and it's quite well, not bred, but it's basically cloned itself side by side by side by side over such an enormous scale that is technically one individual that exists across a 180 kilometer stretch. So it's absolutely enormous. Um, now that particular embayment up there is, is globally important um, and supports, I think, one of the largest uh, seagrass meadows in the world. Now Geograph Bay is much smaller, um, but also um, supports, I guess, fairly significant meadows down there that have a really important role in that environment. When you consider Western Australia as a whole, though, uh, seagrasses do actually exist along much of the coastline. Um, up in the north and, and the Kimberley, um, you get, uh, I guess, more sporadic seagrasses. And this is a couple of maps. This is an intertidal area uh, in Roebuck Bay. Uh, and this is a subtidal area in the Pilbara. Uh, and these are called ephemeral seagrasses. They're, they're much smaller and they come and go a lot. Um, they die off during certain times of year and, and the biomass disappears, I guess, underneath the sediment and then they pop back up later on. So they're not those big meadows that you might might see in the uh, environments around Perth. You move down into Shark Bay uh, and you do get these where these significant meadows kind of kick in. Um, two different species here. The main one is Posidonia, um, which forms those huge, huge beds. Um, but there are a number of other species that exist, um, I guess, within that embayment as well. You move further, further south and you get into those more temperate species. Again, the Posidonia is very, very prominent, uh, but there's other species called Amphibolus, um, which, is, which is actually a pretty cool plant when you see it underwater. Um, and then down at the south coast, again, um, more and more of those temperate species that exist along that area. In terms of the characteristics uh, of those uh, particular environments, uh, they tend to exist in soft sediments. So a lot of these plants like um, I guess, like uh, sand um, to put their roots into. So basically most of these areas that you will see is as prominently uh, is sand environments. Um, where you find those uh, seagrasses always tends to be protected embayments and lagoons and estuaries. Um, they don't like wave action. Um, so they need those more stable, um, I guess, soft sediment systems in order to exist. Um, in terms of their role, they play a really important role in stabilizing sediments. Um, so the root systems that exist down within those sands uh, do exactly the same thing that um, I guess plants do on land. They basically bind all of that material together and hold it in place. Uh, they also play a really important role in carbon capture and storage. Um, this is something that is becoming more and more important obviously in the world that we live in these days. But what happens with um, seagrass is it captures the carbon from the ocean. Um, it takes, takes it down into um, I guess storage systems below the sediment and then it's stored down there through time. And then that builds up and builds up and builds up. So um, seagrasses do turn over a lot and have a high level of productivity, um, which means they do have the ability to store a lot of carbon as well. Uh, and then in terms of their other main roles, um, they maintain water quality by sucking nutrients out of the water. And then they also provide food and habitat for a whole heap of different animal species. And again, if you look at a number of the species that live in those spaces, um, you've obviously got your dugong and your turtle, a lot of people know about. Um, other really cool species like your pipefish uh, and your seahorses love those kind of environments. Um, but then they also play a really important role, um, I guess, as nursery areas uh, for some of our commercially important species. And this is just one of those, the pink snapper uh, and a tiny little juvenile that recruits into those habitats. All right, on to tropical reefs, um, the one that everyone loves, I'm sure. Um, we don't have a Great Barrier Reef over here, but what we do have is some extremely diverse reef systems. Um, they're not a continuous reef and largely they're more dotted along that coastline. But when you consider them all together and all of these uh, little red dots are reef systems that we have along Western Australia, it is a very significant area of coral reef and, and an area that's largely unnoticed when you consider uh, you know, 
the focus that the Great Barrier Reef gets on the other side of our coast. So up in the north and the offshore, we have these atoll systems, places like Rolly Shoals, Scott Reef, Syringa Patam, Ashmore, um, which are these off offshore, I guess, coral reef atolls, highly diverse in the tropical environments. Move into the Kimberley Coast, where you get these really, really tidal, stunted um, coral reef ecosystems, um, where you get these fringes of coral that exist up there in, I guess, extremely challenging environments. Very, very, very cool reef systems. Uh, the inshore Pilbara, um, which are really mixed reef systems. You tend to get low visibility, high nutrient loads down there. Um, they're not the most beautiful reefs in the world, but they're extremely diverse. Um, visibility underwater tends not to be particularly great. And you do get a lot of mixed communities where you get, uh, I guess, coral and algae. And this picture on the left here is a uh, you know, prominent algae up there called Sargassum, that they live together side by side. And those reef environments do live in a natural state where there's a lot of algae and a lot of coral that exist, that exist together. Uh, On to everyone's favourite, Ningaloo. Um, I'm sure a lot of people know about that. You do get some beautiful, beautiful coral reefs along there. It's a fringing reef ecosystem. You move further south down into Shark Bay, um, where you get these inshore, uh, again, highly, uh, highly turbid environments. Um, your coral diversity down in these areas is starting to decline. Further down into the Abrolhos Islands, which is again another unusual one, um, where it's a very, very southern reef ecosystem. Uh, low coral diversity tends to be dominated by a few species. And then lastly, down in the Perth area, you do get some species of coral that exist out in places like the Abrolhos Islands. Um, in terms of the characteristics there, they generally like warm waters, reef building corals. Uh, they are slow growing, are highly diverse and complex structures. There's lots and lots and lots of different types of corals out there. Um, and they, uh, the diversity of those means that they uh, house or can house a lot of different animals. Um, they can be adaptive over long periods of time. You, you get some species of coral that exist uh, in Shark Bay and then also exist up in the Kimberley. And when you consider the different water temperatures that exist in those areas, they do have the ability to adapt to that over hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, they tend to like high, um, both high and low wave energy, and they support highly diverse and abundant animal life. So I am running out of time here, guys, so I will just rip through this one fairly quickly. Uh, temperate reefs. Um, most people don't realise this, but we do have a major temperate reef called the Great Southern Reef that runs along the southern coast of Australia. Um, these ones are generally found in cooler waters only, but are dominated by fleshy canopy forming algae or hard substrate. Now, this is the main canopy forming species down there called the clonia. Um, they basically attach onto hard substrate uh, environments uh, and form highly diverse ecosystems along there. Um, they tend to like high wave energy, so you do get a lot more waves along that southern coast. Um, it's high productivity. Um, lower diversity than tropical reefs, but as I mentioned earlier, high endemism. You get lots of species down on that south coast that don't exist anywhere else. And then lastly, our deep oceans. This is the cool one. Um, so this area of brown um, along the edge here, this is a, a bathymetry map um, of what our uh, ocean depths look like. Um, the area of brown is what's called our continental shelf, and where my cursor is kind of going there is a reef line or sorry a line of about 200 meters depth um, that continental shelf has been formed from years or millions and millions of years of coastal deposition uh, and as our sea level has rise uh, risen and gone up and down through ice ages uh, and the such basically that deposition has caused this uh, this continental shelf it basically means we don't have a lot of deep ocean environments in western australia there are some exceptions to that though on the south coast, we do have some pretty significant canyons, uh, the most prominent of which is the Bremer Canyon. Close into Perth, we have the Perth Canyon, and then up along Ningaloo, we have the Ningaloo Canyons. Um, these were formed by ancient river systems many, many years ago and go to depths of down to about 5,000 metres. Uh, those areas are characterised by low light, uh, low oxygen. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's seen the old school uh, Blue Planet series, but there's some amazing stuff down there where there's very, very low oxygen, um, and uh, which basically means that animals need to find a new way to survive down there. Um, and there are many, many species that have actually adapted to live off sulfur that comes from underwater volcanoes like this, which is absolutely mind-blowing for me. Um, and it makes me think of alien environments, and, and this is a classic example of that. Um, these animals exist under high pressure. Um, as we move further and further and further down underwater, the pressure gets greater and greater. So those animals need to be able to live under that environment. And it's an exact reason why 
when they try and bring fish up from those deep water environments, they actually essentially collapse upon themselves because they do not have the ability to exist under the low pressures that we have up here. Cold temperatures down on the bottom of the ocean, it rarely gets above two to four degrees. So they need to be able to exist in those kind of environments. And it's mostly soft sediment down there. Um, if you would go down and take a picture, um, that's essentially what it would look like. Um, there's a lot of flood, there's a lot of just big open areas of silt down there. You do get a lot of hard substrate, but mostly it's just this. Um, and that's actually formed largely of this little guy. Uh, and this is one of my favourite words in the English dictionary called a globigerina, um, which is a tiny, tiny little plankton. Um, looks like this when you consider under, look at it under a microscope. It's like a series of little balls that are about half a millimetre in width. It forms up about 50% of the sediment on the bottom of the deep oceans um, and the dead skeletons of that. It's essentially lots and lots of organic, organic matter that exists down there and basically means that those environments down there are also highly nutrient rich on the bottom of the ocean. This is the cool thing, uh, all the different species that exist down there, there it is a complete alien world. Um, and I won't go into too much detail, but I will just flash this one up there. Some of the cool, cool stuff that does exist down there, highly, highly adapted to live in those extremely challenging environments. So remember a cold, low light, low oxygen, uh, high pressure. So they've had to adapt through millions and millions of years to live in those locations. And then my favorite of all is the uh, the aptly named sea pig. Um, this guy, as you can see, looks so much like a pig, uh, but this little crew basically cruise, uh, cruises around down there on modified legs uh, and munches up all of that organic matter. And then just lastly, the other super interesting thing about deep oceans is you do also tend to get a lot of large whales that exist in those canyon areas. And that's basically because those cold waters um, drive up that new, um, and you get all those nutrient which waters on the bottom when you get ocean currents, drives all of that nutrients up to the surface and creates a lot of productivity on the surface of fish and squid and things like that. All those kinds of things that some of our whales love to eat. So you go down the coast to Bremer and it's a well-known spot for orca. Basically they come in to feed down there. And you also get species like sperm whale that love to hang out in those kinds of environments. And that's it for today, guys. So I've just gone through a massive amount of information there. Um, bit of a brain dump. I hope you guys have got something out of that. Um, and I would like to open it up to you guys if anyone has any few questions now. Hey, Tom, can you hear us? Yep. Awesome. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I did a whole degree in marine science and I never heard the word globby gerina before. So I learned something it's today. It's a cool word. <laughs> I, I, I learned that in my first year of university who yeah. taught that word and it's, yeah, it's the best word ever. <laughs> Stuck with you. Um, Elise says she's got a question. So Elise, if you don't mind coming up and then I'll get one of the boys to ask a question after that. Elise, just bring it, bring it up here. Don't worry, your face doesn't come up really big. Come closer so we can hear you. Can't be any bigger than mine, Elise. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Just um, talk at the TV. <laughs> at the TV? Oh, great. Um, Good day, Elise. Um, what's your favourite place in WA because of its like environment and ecosystem? Uh, my favourite place is actually a place called um, the, the Montebello Islands, so which is off the Pilbara coast. Um, uh, most people are aware of, is everyone aware of Barrow Island? <coughs> Yeah. yeah, it's it's up off the Pilbara coast, but the Monte Bellows is is um it's this crazy archipelago of these ridiculously complex um I guess islands, and I'll I'll, I'll mention that to Lauren if you get a chance to to flash up a I guess a a screen cap of the Monte Bello Islands. They're amazingly complex. Support these crazy crazy I guess fish communities, um which is which is what I love. But I just love the complexity and the remoteness of it out there. It's an amazing, amazing place. And it's there's so few people out there. Um, every time I go there, I just, yeah, I'm in my happy place for sure. Awesome. Can I get one of the guys to come up? You can do it. Um, I actually worked on Barrow Island. So yeah, I was almost okay. there, But I was bored, you know, I was working FIFA. I didn't get to do any of the cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what have we got, Zave? Um... What steps should we take if we want to get a job with your department? Ah, oh, good question. Oh, that's that's right. You guys are actually question. taking some of the initial steps right now, which is amazing. And I was so stoked to hear um, John saying that you guys are doing like things like your skippers tickets and your diving tickets and things like that. 
um, those are actually really important these days in a world of occupation of health and safety is our qualifications are getting harder and harder to get. So often when we're looking for, for staff, we are looking for those kinds of qualifications. Um, the other thing I will though say is, is it's about being in the right place at the right time and ensuring that you're there. Um, you know, I can speak to many, many times in my career where it's been pure luck that I've actually ended up there. Um, but in order to get there, I've also made sure I've been putting myself in the right situation to when those opportunities come. So when an opportunity comes your way, don't ever say no. Um, put yourself out there, speak to people. Um, in our kinds of places, we do sometimes take on volunteers um, to come in and just hang out around our offices and do bits and pieces. And, and that's a great way to get your faces in there. Um, but at the end of the day, it is also necessary to, to, to get a university degree. Um, you know, things are fairly competitive or in the marine sciences sector in general. Um, and that's to a large extent why I went through and did my PhD. Um, it's not because I wanted a doctor in front of my name. It's, it's basically because it was three years worth of work experience that I essentially got by doing that, that once I entered the job market, it, it gave me that leg up. So, um, yeah, the PhD certainly did help. Um, but it's not necessarily required, different depending on what you want to do. Um, you know, there's a range of jobs, there's there's policy jobs, there's a lot of different areas of marine science that you can move into that don't require that kind of level of uh, level of commitment. Put it that way. 